Okay, I think it's time to uh, launch for our the final lecture of the of this week. Um, and uh, I think that Ramil will start by defining Gestalt for us. <laughs> right. So this this was. I should review the uh, uh, state of cosmological simulations, right? Because the, in these simulations, we're trying to put it all together. We're trying to put together all the subgrid models and all the different detailed physics that we've heard about, the ISM, the black holes, uh, the star formation, all these sorts of things. Um, we didn't, haven't talked too much about you know, the growth of large-scale structure and stuff, but hopefully you guys are, are familiar with that aspect of it. So we want all the, to combine all this and <coughs> come up with models, viable models, for the evolution of why galaxies kind of look the way they do. Right? Okay, so I sort of divided this into three parts. Okay? So there is the id of galaxy formation models, right? which is uh, basically talking about the, the primary processes involved. Uh, the ego, uh, where we're going to discuss uh, the essentially reality testing. All right? And uh, the angst, of course, at the end, uh, which is the, the deep anxiety or dread that we have uh, about the fact that our models don't really agree with the data in all ways, right? Uh, so how, how, can we, how can we fix this? So <clears throat> I'm not going to talk too much about the gravity and hydrodynamics parts of the cosmological simulations. We've kind of, well, we, you know, hopefully uh, that's... Uh, uh, you know, been, been covered in terms of different hydrodynamics methods and so on and so forth. But I think what has is, what is become uh, abundantly clear is that, you know, the difference that we see between AMR and SPH or some of these moving mesh things are really subdominant compared to the differences that we see between different implementations of subgrid physics, right? And this is really the, the, the key these days in, in current galaxy formation modeling is how do we translate all this uh, very complex stuff that we see at this microphysical level by, by astronomical scale standards uh, into something that can viably represent uh, galaxies growing on, on large scales. So the idea is, of course, we want to track the entire evolution of galaxies within sort of a cosmological large scale structure context from the earliest uh, little bursty, uh, you know, irregular dwarf star forming things into you know the what we think is the the next progression, which is these these large disks, and then you know s finally off into the uh, the large mass of ellipticals. So what are what are some of the subgrid processes that we're going to need to be able to to uh, to create this right? So the, again, the number you should keep in mind is that when we're talking cosmological simulations, you're talking typical resolution of around a kiloparsec, right? So we're, we're, we're looking for models that, that are going to describe or an effective theory, effect, you know, in a sense, on a kiloparsec scale, right? Um, and it might be 100 parsecs, it might be a kiloparsec, you know, it, it, but it's in that range, right? So <coughs> for the early phases, of course, we're going to, uh, obviously, we're going to need a, a subgrid model for star formation, right? We heard uh, from, from Eve how complex this is, but we're going to need to be able to distill that in some way uh, into a, a theory that kind of gives the right answer on a, on a kiloparsec scale. We're going to need to consider photoionization <coughs> um, and the impact that that might have both on uh, galaxy growth as well as uh, within galaxies. And uh, also, we start to see the chemical enrichment can be very important. We talked about uh, you know, early star formation perhaps having a different mode when you're at very low metallicity. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, of course, we want to track the growth of the chemical uh, elements. And it turns out this has, you know, as we, as we measure, are able to measure the metallicity at later times, we find that this is actually quite sensitive to things like uh, galactic outflows. So, <coughs> these, these galaxies, if you remember from you know, our, our previous discussion on Monday and, and fear, uh, subsequent uh, talks as well, 
You know that these galaxies need to be ejecting material at very large rates compared to their star formation rates, you know, up order of at least a few, up to 10, you know, maybe even up to 100 in some models, right? Times, so their, their outflow rates have to be that times the, the star formation rate, this mass loading factor. So these things are blowing out very large winds. Uh, and so that's going to that's gonna impact their, their um, evolution as well. So as we come down to this scale, you know, we have to think very carefully about these galactic outflows and how that might <coughs> uh, change all the different observable properties of these galaxies. Um, as we get on to later times, we have uh, not just sort of uh, type 2 supernova feedback or, or enrichment, we also have uh, type 1a starting to become important. So uh, these are, of course, coming from either typically something associated with white dwarfs, either a, a mass transfer onto them or perhaps uh, white dwarf mergers or something like this. And then stellar evolution, <coughs> we have to consider the impact of more long-lived stars, not just the OB stars that are giving rise to the, the strong winds and the, um, all these, these uh, uh, you know, radiation and stuff, but uh, some of these, the, particularly th this can impact the chemical enrichment, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And then, you know, as we start to grow fairly, you know, substantially massive galaxies, these, the, the growth of black holes becomes important, right? So we, we want to be able to grow black holes in a way that's uh, such that galaxies lie on the, the M sigma relation, or, or, um, and we want to be able to, uh, uh, <coughs> you know, grow black holes from an early time uh, such that they are impacting galaxies in a way that, that results in the observable properties. And if you remember uh, that, that what was been talked about by, <coughs> by, um, by Priya, uh, in this phase, oftentimes you have a more radiatively efficient uh, way of growing the black holes, which we'll talk about. So then finally, you know, again, galaxy transformation uh, from, from all these into these stages, we have the last stage where we have perhaps a, a different mode of, of black hole growth, um, this sort of ADAF mode that was, that was discussed. And we have to have some feedback that, that turns this galaxy from a star-forming thing into a, into a quenched thing. So these are the various ingredients that we're going to need in order to build our galaxy formation model. And <coughs> there, of course, each of these has a huge amount of physics that so goes into it. That's something I hope that you appreciate from the previous uh, discussion, but we're going to try to distill this down somehow. OK, so let's start by talking about star formation. Obviously, galaxies are made of stars, and we'd like to be able to turn the gas into stars um, in, our, in our galaxy formation model. Now, most of the, the work in, at cosmological scales essentially uh, follows something that was basically you know, an idea that was developed, uh, put out first by, by Schmidt. And it's, it's nothing but a scaling relation, really. I mean, it's, it's a dimensional analysis, effectively, that you have some gas density. It's able to collapse on some dynamical time within some region. And some fraction of that, you know, some efficiency uh, is going to turn into stars. OK, so it's really just a, a dimensional argument. Uh, the point is that the dynamical time, of course, scales as uh, rho to the minus 1 half. And so this ends up some, being something like rho gas to the 1.5, right? So from this, you immediately realize that, that uh, star formation is not going to be a linear process in density, but is going to be enhanced uh, preferentially to the, compared to the density in the, in the more dense regions. Uh, there are observations of this, this quantity, at least on somewhat relevant scales. Uh, so for instance, we, uh, we, uh, we want to create this uh, 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 a, gas, a, ga a galaxy that um, obeys some observations. Well, what observations are we going to look at? Well, the most obvious one is this one you've seen before. This is this Kennecott-Schmidt relation, where we have the star formation rate surface density here uh, plotted against, in this case, the, the, star, the gas surface density divided by the, the free fall time. <coughs> and this efficiency value right, of 0.02 is uh, essentially determines the normalization of this, this uh, relation. And it turns out that if you take this law, put in epsilon of 0.02, and run, run simulations, they end up lying on the Kennecott Schmidt relation. So that's a nice self consistency that, in general, that basically works that we can use this epsilon of 0.02 that we get from um, 
from the, the, the Kenneka Schmidt law and put it into galaxy formation simulations and get something that reproduces the Kenneka Schmidt law. Okay, it's sort of a circular thing, but it's a good consistency check, right? Um, but things are a little bit more <coughs> complicated, and, and one thing that we have to worry about is the fact that we have very poor resolution in these cosmological simulations. And so, as you know, gas is turning into stars in, in actuality at very, in very dense gas, you know, densities above maybe 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 uh, atoms per cubic centimeter. Generally, we don't resolve such gas in cosmology on kiloparsec scale simulations. And so we have to basically, you know, back off from that and allow star formation in lower density gas. Otherwise, we'll never get any star formation, right? So that's bad. So you typically apply some sort of a threshold for <coughs> a density threshold. And uh, a typical value in a cosmological simulation is something like 0.1 atoms per cubic centimeter, which is embarrassingly low, right? But at least in the early simulations, this was adopted. This is all calibrated. You could get things that look like a Kennecott-Schmidt law. So you know, we were happy with that, even though we know that stars don't actually form at this density, right? Uh, now, it's true that the efficiency at this density is quite low still, right? Because remember, the efficiency is going to scale uh, up with the density. But this general prescription is often called the Kennecott Schmidt star formation prescription in these simulations. And it was uh, you know, first done in the early 90s when people were first uh, starting to, to run galaxy formation simulations. And it was basically the norm until you know, less than a decade ago. Okay? Um, so one of the first, then people started to think, okay, well, you know, this is all well and good, but uh, you know, we can match the data, but can we do something that's a little bit more physically motivated? Well, one of the things we can start with is to, first of all, think, okay, if we have higher resolution simulations, let's say we have AMR, or we have you know, the ability to do zooms or something like that, then we can just say that, okay, we can just raise that threshold. So what are the more modern ways that people try to, to to simulate star formation a little bit more accurately, one thing that people do is just simply raise the density threshold. So you say that oh, stars only form in dense gas, but otherwise are, are similar. Um, there are other sort of prescriptions that have been uh, thought about. So for instance, Eagle contains a prescription that, which depends on the gas pressure. Um, <coughs> but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, later, and then you can have a threshold density that is typically of order 0.1, but scales with metallicity. Again, this is something that, uh, that is uh, uh, observed uh, that in the Kennecott schmidt relation that the turndown at, in star formation efficiency at low uh, surface densities depends on metallicity. Then, or alternatively, people have now tried to actually implement uh, the formation of molecular hydrogen into these codes, right? Because we think, okay, stars form out of molecular hydrogen, so let's try to follow the molecular hydrogen as best we can. Again, we are very limited by resolution. Uh, there's been a lot of work by you know, people like Mark Krumholz, Nick Gnadin, um, and others on uh, trying to create a subgrid prescription based on Milky Way, the way we think H2 forms in the Milky Way and the conditions, and then just kind of scale it with the Milky Way uh, radiation field intensity. And so one, one thing that, that people have started to use is to take these subgrid prescriptions, which basically could rely on the local density as well as some estimate of the, uh, the shielding associated with that gas, right? So that's one of the key things to form H2 is you need to be able to shield from the interstellar radiation field. If you aren't gonna do the radiative transfer within the ISM, which would be incredibly expensive, you can't do that, you have to come up with some approximation uh, uh, what's often used is this Sobolev approximation, which is rho, effectively rho over grad rho, which gives you a scale height for your local density, which then allows you to translate that based on the density into some sort of a column density, which then gives you a shielding, uh, a, a, the ability to shield, right? So based on these quantities, which you can compute in the simulation for your given particle, you can get a H2 density for your gas, or an H2 fraction for your gas, and you replace the rho gas in your Kennecott schmidt prescription with rho H2. Um, but you can try to even be more sophisticated, right? You can say, okay, uh, instead of trying to use this sort of very crude way of accounting for interstellar radiation field, why don't we actually try to do it directly using our code, right, as best we can? So still don't want to do radiative transfer, but what, they, what you can do 
is try to sum up the, the interstellar radiation field, you know, the H2 dissociating lyman Werner photons uh, from your entire galaxy. And you can do this because you're doing sort of a gravity tree walk anyway to get your distant uh, 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 contributions to the gravitational force. Well, you know, you can tag along with that some sort of uh, summing up of the optical depth to those distant regions as well. So while you're, while you're computing the gravitational uh, moments, you can also at the same time uh, sum up the, the optical depths. And because of that, you can then estimate what the interstellar radiation field is a little more directly, right? And so this was, for instance, implemented by Charlotte Christensen. Then what you need to do is, is actually track the H2 directly. So each particle now has uh, the, the various species associated with the formation and destruction of, of uh, molecular hydrogen and, and solves those reaction rates on the fly based on you know, the local density, local temperature, as well as the, the local interstellar radiation field. So this is kind of a, a highly sophisticated way to do it. Uh, it's mostly used in sort of zoom, zoom simulations uh, and can be quite effective, but you know, I think uh, it's, it remains to be seen whether this actually, you know, this sort of uh, the shielding calculation actually has much meaning, although you can do it. So, and then finally, there's, there's sort of new criteria. I think we ho heard a little bit about this from Ramon, uh, about, uh, you know, based on sort of turbulence and, and uh, that sort of thing. The, the real issue with these kind of things, so that works very well if you have extremely high resolution simulations, but <coughs> all of these turbulent models essentially depend on this sound speed, right, which goes as t to the one half. So why is that a problem? Well, <coughs> it's a problem because you need to know the temperature of the gas. Why is that a problem? Well, it comes to this. The problem is that you have, again, very poor resolution, right? If you remember your genes mass, your genes mass goes as t to the 3 half over density to the 1 half, right? And that means that as your, um, your, your genes mass is going to be very sensitive to your gas temperature. So you need to be able to te follow the temperature of this gas all the way down to the kind of temperatures that actually are forming the stars, which are of order 10 Kelvin or something like that. If you start to compute the genes mass associated with that, it's you know, hundreds of solar masses, uh, you know, whereas our particle masses in typical cosmological simulations are at least 10 to the 4, if not 10 to the 6 or something like this. Right? So you're, and, and 100 is very generous, actually. It can be significantly smaller than that. So, uh, so the problem is that you have to say that, okay, we can't resolve the genes mass, but we don't want to just let the code, you know, we could cool the gas arbitrarily in the code, but the problem is we will be cooling it to a point where we will get artificial fragmentation because we're not actually resolving the genes mass properly, right? So to avoid this, so in the early disk galaxy simulations, without, these, without any sort of you know, way to mitigate this, you got uh, essentially these horribly clumpy disks, right? Uh, so Brant Robertson's, uh, these are some of Brant Robertson's work with, Ro with Lars and others uh, that basically tried to form galactic disk and found that if you don't account for this, what happens is everything, just all these little clumps just form into a whole bunch of clumps. You don't get anything that looks like any kind of disk galaxy we've ever seen, right? Um, rather amusingly, this was repackaged as a feature when they started talking about Redshift 2 clumpy disks. Uh, <coughs> uh, but, you know, that, that's a separate sociological story. Um, <laughs> so, and then, um, you know, so you say, okay, well, we can try to, you know, force the gas to stay at some temperature like that, but what uh, really was the most successful is trying to pressurize the ISM based on some sort of criterion for uh, not necessarily resolving the genes mass, but in this case, what they used is something that's still quite commonly used, which is, uh, which is developed by Fulker and Lars, uh, which is essentially a, 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 a subgrid version of McKee and Ostriker, something you've heard about quite a lot, right? Uh, where you have sort of cold clouds embedded in a hot medium. So rather than thinking of a uniform gas particle with a uniform density and temperature, you think of it as, a, as a containing a whole bunch of small cold clouds surrounding in, in some hot medium, kind of like the way we think of the ISM just a two-phase ISM, you know, obviously that's a simplification, um, and then <coughs> use uh, equations to sort of uh, understand the transfer of, you know, the cooling of the, of the cold stuff, uh, of the hot stuff onto the cold stuff, and the evaporation, so on and so forth, and you can come up with a description of a 
what, what the effective temperature is based on how much is of the gas at any given point is in this cold phase versus the hot phase, right? And this temperature is, is rather arbitrary. But nonetheless, um, what you get, so it, it, here's a temperature versus, in this case, overdensity diagram. So this corresponds to over densities of about one atom per cubic centimeter right here. And <coughs> uh, what you get in this type of model are, are these sorts of curves, depending on you know, what exactly you're looking at. I won't get into too many details, but effectively, uh, you, instead of just cooling down to very low temperatures, down to 10 Kelvin over here, which is what, would, what should happen, right, you then have this effective equation of state right, that, uh, that pressurizes the gas, keeps it stable, and al allows it to prevent this sort of fragmentation, and you end up with you know, a nice disk look looking disk galaxy. Okay? So, <clears throat> so that was one way to do it. Um, they, you know, as, as Fulker and Lars pointed out, you can compare this to sort of an effective equation of state of the gas, and this is the, uh, uh, the effective equation of state for this particular model. It turns out, uh, Shea and Dallavecchia pointed out that if you choose an effective equation of state such that the temperature is proportional to density to the one third, you, you know, leave it as an exercise, pretty, probably do it in your head, to show that this keeps the genes mass a constant, a resolved at a constant level, right, independent of density. And that's, I just sort of drew that on as, as the red line, as sort of an equa effective equation of state in that model. So, but in all cases, right, you're, you're essentially, your temperature is a fake temperature, okay? That's, that's uh, the, the message in these cosmological simulations. Your temperature in the star-forming gas is a fake temperature, right? It's a temperature that's determined by what choice of pre ISM pressurization you make, right? Um, <coughs> and uh, as a result, right, if you want to compute something like the sound speed, this is very problematic, right? Because what, sa what are you computing the sound speed of? You certainly shouldn't just compute it from this temperature, but what temperature should you assume in that case, right? Uh, so th then you can almost get any answer you want. So that's, that's uh, this ISM pressurization. Again, this is used in pretty much every cosmological simulation, one of these two schemes. Okay, so that was mostly star formation. Um, so you have the Kenneka Schmidt, you have the ISM pressurization. What about the photoionizing background? Uh, so this, you know, again, has been included from the very earliest simulations that, uh, that many people, that, you know, people in this room started to do back in the 90s. And <coughs> the typical assumption in these models is that you have a, a evolving spatially, but spatially uniform ionizing background, okay? And this applies to all particles, right? So we don't do any radiative transfer. We assume it's all optically thin. And then you just have to choose your ionizing background. And <coughs> so this is just a, a, a little plot showing a ver variety of examples of, of recent determinations of the ionizing background. Um, and uh, this, is, this allows you then, with this ionizing background, to calculate the photoheating rates uh, and the, the photo dissociation rates from you know, just integrals, which you then apply uh, in, onto your gas particles as, as they evolve. So you have the cooling term from the radiative, plus you have the heating term from this, right? And you know, hopefully you remember your physics, that heating term is gonna be you know, particularly, uh, it, it scales as the density, whereas the cooling goes as density squared, so at low densities, it's the heating term that kind of dominates, and you can uh, essentially uh, get a lot of low density gas that's uh, dominated by uh, that, that's whose temperature is set by that heating rate, right? And, um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of controversy right now. There's this so-called uh, 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 photon underproduction crisis, which some people claim is solved, but that's wrong. Um, so you can ask me about that later. I won't go into it. So, <coughs> okay, so that's a very, very, you know, crude approximation, obviously, and, and obviously, as we've heard, during reionization, that's a very poor approximation. So we want to be able to do radiative transfer. Again, I don't want to get into this too much. One of the very, you know, crude ways that you can just implement something into the code, which has nothing to do with radiative transfer, is that you can self-shield the gas in the dense region. So various codes have started to do this now, including ours, uh, where essentially you can come up with, based on radiative transfer simulations, you can come up with a way to compute the effective ionizing background at a given density. So 
you know, at low densities, you have the full ionizing background. As you get to higher and higher densities, you see effectively less and less of the ionizing background. You can calibrate a prescription based on radiative transfer simulations and put that into your cosmological simulations such that when you get into a dense gas regime, typically it starts to kick in above about, you know, gas density of about 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 2. You start to be impacted by this, and a significant portion of your gas goes into a self-shielded mode where you're actually in a neutral phase rather than in a almost completely ionized phase. So that's one, one cheap and dirty way to do it. Uh, then, of course, you want to do, you know, if you want to do sort of early universe things, you want to uh, do something much more fancy. And Ramon talked a lot about, a lot about this, so I won't, I won't go into it too much. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> but essentially, you know, for, for various reasons, uh, it's, you know, uh, well, I won't, I won't go into like which one is, is typically used. All of these methods are basically used these days. To, to do the, the evolution of uh, the radiative transfer. And these days, it's rel getting relatively common to do it along with the hydrodynamics and the full galaxy formation model. So we developed a model like that back in 2009. Christian Finlater, uh, my student at that time, was, uh, was developed it. And, but other people have developed it, many similar things since then. OK, so that was the ionizing background. So our other ingredient now is chemical enrichment. So what do we have to consider for, for chemical enrichment? Um, well, obviously, we have to consider type 2 supernovae. That's kind of going to be the dominant thing in most, um, most cases for producing, uh, producing uh, metals and distributing them. So <coughs> you know, this, this uh, naturally comes from OB stars, which have lifetimes less than you know, a few tens of me mega years, and typically produces uh, elements that are alpha enhanced. So you know, those are the alpha elements, of course. These are the, m the multiples of four uh, isotopes, which are particularly stable. So, <coughs> so these alpha, it, it produces an, an alpha enhanced uh, enrichment pattern. And then you have to say, OK, I have my star formation, right? From my star formation, I can then calculate how many supernovae are going to go off, right? Once I have how many supernovae are going to go off, I can then figure out how, many, how much metal should have been generated from that supernova, because I can go ask my supernova modeler friends what their favorite yields are for, for their supernovae. right? And so I can plug that in and say, now I can track various chemical elements. right? And as of about 10 years ago, people just typically tracked you know, hydrogen helium metals. right? We had just one big block. right? These days, people are a little bit more sophisticated and are now tracking individual elements, typically off order at least a few, you know, up to, uh, I think, you know, some can track up to 30 or something like that. And the reason, of course, that it, it becomes interesting to start tracking all these elements, if it was all just type 2 yields, they would all just sort of scale with each other. But the fact is that there are other things that can create metals. Uh, so for instance, type 1As, and particularly uh, from stellar evolution, AGB stars are particularly effective because they're blowing off their envelopes, which are quite, quite metal enriched, right? To eventually form their white dwarf. So, <coughs> um, so uh, these type 1As, as you may or may not hopefully know, they're, they're particularly high in their iron output in terms of iron enrichment, um, essentially because they're, you know, they, remember, they're, they're white dwarf mass transfer type thing. So you're, you're stuffing stuff onto the white dwarf. The white dwarf is getting denser and denser. It only reaches iron or nickel. And that's when you, know, you can't extract any more binding energy. So that's it. That's when it goes supernovae. So, uh, so they end up being quite iron rich, right? Uh, their ejecta ends up being quite iron rich. And this is very helpful because that means that if you look at alpha to iron, oh, sorry, that's being alpha to iron, it's kind of like a clock, right? In the sense that. These are from you know, quite, quite a bit longer time scale than that stuff. So if you, ha if you see highly alpha enriched, that means that most of the enrichment came from this. But as you go on in time, you start to see lower and lower, uh, mo lower, and lower alpha enrichment relative to the iron. right? And this is seen in some things, so for instance, things like halo stars in the Milky Way. The halo stars in the Milky Way, which presumably formed much earlier, uh, were, were uh, <coughs> or you know, and are, are much older tend to be alpha enriched compared to the disk stars that we see today, like the sun. Right. So um, then there's several ways to try to model the type 1As. Uh, I think these days, so we started out using something like a you can you can. So the question is, we can go out and measure the type 1A rates, but the type 1As can come from from several different populations. Turns out, 
So the one way to parameterize is using a prompt component and a delayed component. The prompt component essentially goes off with the type twos, and then you have some delayed component. And again, this is typically done stochastically. So you have these star particles. So you've created a star particle in your simulation. It's wandering around. And every time step, you roll the dice. And you say, should I turn into a whole poof and whole, turn into a whole bunch of gas, or do some sort of a modeling where you, where you essentially distribute the metals uh, from the type 1As that would have gone off in that star particle into surrounding gas, right? A, a somewhat more typically way it's done more modern uh, sense is to use something like a delay time distribution where uh, essentially if you have a given star particle, it then becomes eligible to form type 1A supernovae after some time, and then it follows some sort of a, a time uh, distribution uh, which you can then implement, and then for, you know you count up the number of type one A's and distribute your metals accordingly. Uh, similarly, for AGB stars, here we uh, can use the fact that we you know have stellar population models, you know things like Bruce Shaw and Charlot or or Charlie Conroy's FSPS models, and those tell us that for a given star, still one solar mass of star, after so many years, you're going to have less than one solar mass because it will have you know lost some of the, the you know on average uh, for a given IMF will have lost some of its mass. And that mass then has particular yields for, for these sorts of AGB stars. Those happen to be typically high in carbon, okay? So uh, the, the AGB stars can be an important source of carbon at late times. One of the key things to sort of keep in mind is that the yields are really not that well known. Even for type twos, uh, certainly for type ones, and uh, type ones are actually kind of the best ones known, and, and, but also even for AGB stars. So uh, this, is, this is, of course, something we can't deal with. It's stellar modeling, stellar evolution modeling, and, uh, but, and, and supernova modeling. So these, these things are, can be quite uncertain. So one has to sort of keep that in mind you know, when you're computing metallicities from simulations, not to, you know, re to, to realize that you may have a pretty significant slop factor uh, in these things. OK, so that's kind of the you know, stellar part of what's going on, right? So you have the star formation, you have the, the, the uh, chemical enrichment. So the next sort of crucial part, and, and the part that probably is, um, you know, along with black holes, the least certain about all this stuff is, is these galactic outflows, okay? So we believe that these young stars then are uh, responsible, these OB stars typically, are responsible for driving all these galactic outflows that we see and need to have in order to match all these observations and so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> and so people immediately realize, people realize this, you know, even in the very first simulations of galaxies, we realized, okay, we have supernova going off, we should have some, some return of that energy into the surrounding gas. Well, the simplest thing to do was to just add it to the surrounding gas, right? That seems simple enough. So you take your little, st little star particle that just forms, and you say, OK, based on my IMF, you know, some percentage of that, you know, maybe 10% or 20%, depending on your IMF, uh, is going to be lost into the, the surrounding gas. And that's going to carry a bunch of energy with it. And it's going to create a bubble, like a super bubble, that we see around us, for instance, around the sun, right? OK, that sounded really good. And it did absolutely nothing. Right? And of course, the obvious reason is that in the simulation, when you have one kiloparsec resolution, you actually don't, aren't resolving some sort of nice hot super bubble and then the rest of the stuff. Right? You're going to average all that over. You're going to say this is a really dense pasture of gas, you know, which, which is basically just a smooth thing. And that's going to cool very rapidly. So all that energy you added is going to do nothing. Okay? It's just going to make your galaxy super, super bright, which is definitely not observed So in the x-rays or something. So nonetheless, this is kind of what was used up through you know, around 2000 when I first started doing simulations uh, and got galaxies that look nothing like data, right? OK, so how does one combat this? Well, kind of the simplest technical thing one could do is say, OK, I'm just going to turn off cooling. I'm just going to turn arbitrarily turn off cooling for a while, right? Because that sounds good, right? Cooling is the problem. Uh, physics be damned. But you know, then people started to like, you know, uh, you know, say, OK, well, can we retroactively justify this? Well, one of the ways you could retroactively justify this uh, is, is the way the gasoline team does it, where <coughs> essentially they, they view the supernova explosion as, as a you know, 
um, not insensibly as a, as a set off Taylor blast wave. And they say that, well, okay, we're not, we're not resolving the first part of that uh, scenario where essentially you have energy conserving uh, uh, winds. And because of that, we're gonna turn off the, the cooling for the time that, that that blast wave is going out. So you can calculate what that is based on the parameters of your local uh, environment. And that turns out to be, you know, off order few million years or 10 million years, then you have this hot bubble of gas that is actually able to act now. It's, it's around for long enough that the pressure from that is able to push the stuff around it instead of immediately cooling it away and doing nothing. And then you start to get things like outflows and stuff like that, okay? So that, that's one way to do it. Uh, another way to do it is to basically, um, you know, then, then the Eagle folks are very, you know, very adamant about, we're gonna do physics, you know, we're, we're physicists, doggone it. We don't wanna turn off cooling. Uh, so, well, well, of course it didn't work if you didn't turn off cooling. So they kind of tried to use a backdoor way and say, okay, uh, we're gonna store up the energy in our gas particles that are forming stars until such time that the temperature reaches something like a few, you know, tens of millions of Kelvin, okay? Which of course not really seen in the ISM. Nonetheless, at those temperatures, the cooling times are long. Right? I mean, that's just what they are, right? Uh, because basically all you have is Bremsstrahlen. So it's effectively like a cooling shutoff model, although you know, they can write on the glossy brochure that they don't ever shut off cooling. Uh, so, uh, so the two things actually formally work a lot like each other, okay? So that is a way to do it, right? Everybody's gotta have something, right? We've all, we've all gotta use some kind of uh, fudge here, okay. So what's another way to do it? Well, the other sort of main approach is to use kinetic feedback, right? And by kinetic feedback, what we want is we want to have winds coming out of the galaxy. Now, <clears throat> again, we can't resolve these winds. We have no idea we, even what is even creating these winds right at this moment, right? So, uh, but nonetheless, we can observe winds in a lot of galaxies, and we can at least try to uh, create uh, a, a model that, that if, even though we don't understand theoretically where it comes from, we see some winds coming out of galaxies, so let's just put those winds into galaxies and throw stuff out and see what happens, right? And so this was introduced by, again, by uh, Folker and Lars, that essentially you kick with the, the gas with some velocity and you choose some mass loading factor. So for every star that forms, I'm gonna kick two gas particles with this velocity in some either random direction or out of the disk or however you want to do it, right? Um, so in the original models, they basically just tried to make educated guesses about what these values might be, driven by the idea that they wanted to suppress star formation enough to get the cosmic, you know, this Madau plot, the cosmic star formation rate density roughly correctly. Um, and, you know, already they found that the amount of mass that you had to kick out, uh, you know, for, from all galaxies, so this is hopping with all star, you know, every star formation event is going to kick out two gas particles nearby at this wind speed. And you had to do that, you know, over all galaxies. And that was already a bit of a surprise because back then nobody talked about galactic outflows except for, you know, wacky people who studied weird things like M82, right? Uh, or wacky people like uh, Mordecai, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, so, you know, that was already kind of a surprise that we had to have these outflows be, you know, not at least comparable to the star formation rate, the amount that's kicked out of galaxies, if we want to get anything like the cosmic star formation rate density right, and would believe lambda CDM and all these things. So, um, that, was, that was a good start. Uh, it was improved upon a little bit by, by, by us when we were trying to say, okay, let's try to think about more physical justifications for why these wind scalings might be what they are. And one particular model that was gaining a lot of traction right around then was this uh, radiative, uh, uh, or essentially, yeah, radiative winds or, or uh, essentially analogous to stellar winds where you have radiation rather than the supernovae itself. It's the radiation pressure from the OB stars that are hitting the dust. The dust is electrostatically coupled to the gas and that essentially drives some sort of an outflow. And <clears throat> Norm Murray and company worked this out in a paper, and they noted that the observed trends that you get for the wind speed uh, as a function of global galaxy properties like the circular velocity and the, the, the mass holding factor, you know, to conserve momentum, you're gonna have to have those two things be the inverse of each other. And so these are these momentum conserving winds, and they actually produce the data that, you know, was very rough data at the time from Crystal Martin and stuff. And we also showed 
in these papers that not only do they actually you know, produce some pretty good galaxies, they actually enrich the intergalactic medium um, with, in a manner that is consistent what, what, with what we see in quasar absorption lines. And so I think this was a nice, uh, the, the important part of this was that now we're actually tying what's going on deep within the galaxy to something that's going on on megaparsec scales that we can observe with quasar absorption lines, right? And uh, the, the, you know, uh, and of course this had you know, already been tried with, you know, with, more, with less, uh, or how should I say, more post-processing type models by Anthony Aguirre, myself, uh, but now we had a self-consistent model that was both able to get the galaxy properties right and the IGM properties right, and I think that's why, that's what really sort of uh, set the stage for a lot of thinking about this whole baryon cycle cosmic ecosystem thing. So, <coughs> um, so you know, that was, that's sort of one approach of, of trying to use these very simplified scalings motivated by, you know, analytic modeling. These days, of course, you can try to do zoom simulations or very high resolution simulations in some way that directly predict the mass outflow rate. I mean, we've seen some of these examples already that simulations are trying to actually directly predict how much mass is escaping out of these galaxies when you have a certain amount of star formation you know, distributed in a certain way. The results are very uncertain right now. Nonetheless, there have been some you know, fairly successful cases, for instance, the fire simulations, uh, the simulations from Charlotte Christensen that was using the gasoline code, and they can actually predict how these quantities, the wind speed and the mass loading factor, scale with galaxy properties like the circular velocity or the stellar mass or whatever it is, global galaxy properties that we can compute on the fly even though we only have kiloparsec resolution, right? So we can, we can still compute the amount of stellar mass in our galaxy without having to worry about the details of the, the ISM. So that's, that's another approach is to try to use these sorts of scaling directly. Um, the one thing to keep in mind about this kinetic feedback model is, again, we have kind of an analogous problem to we, what we had way up here, in that if we kick the particle and we just let it do its thing, right, it's immediately going to run into a wall of ISM gas. And that wall of ISM gas is going to heat the heck out of it. It's going to be ex almost exactly identical to this case, right? So we have to then do something to get the particles out of the, galax out of the interstellar medium out you know, uh, at a sufficient distance that, uh, that we're not going to just end up in this phase, right? <laughs> this is you know, one of the real sort of you know, uh, things that is uh, you know, large, whatever you call it, you know, white elephant or something in the room, that, that we have to do this so-called decoupling where we, we allow these particles to travel for a bit without applying any hydrodynamic forces before we, we turn them on again, we recouple them at a later time. Um, and you know, the results are you know, that we try to make them as insensitive as possible to the parameters that we choose for this, but it is another set of parameters we have to, we have to think about. Okay, uh, so what about just to sort of, you know, since galactic outflows are so important, there's been a lot of uh, work on trying to measure their properties using things like uh, uh, you know, the galactic outflows in, in nearby galaxies using uh, either cold ISM lines, a lot of work by Kate Rubin Company, or in this case, work by, uh, this is from John Chisholm and, and uh, <coughs> Christy Tremonti and company, trying to measure the ionized gas outflows. And so I just, I just wanted to show that the people are trying to measure these things and what they're roughly getting, right? Again, there's a lot of uncertainty that goes into this. So you, you measure some sort of an emission line or some sort of an absorption line, depending on exactly what you're doing. And then you're measuring it in some particular ion. Uh, in this case, you know, I think it was magnesium-2. Um, and there are other cases where you look at sodium-1, whatever it is. OK, well, that's you know, all you're seeing is the amount of sodium-1 or whatever. You want to know the total mass. So there's a lot of steps to go from sodium-1 to total mass. right? You have to worry about how much of the sodium is in sodium-1. You have to worry about what the metallicity of that stuff is so you can convert sodium in, into total gas. and then. All of these things depend on the density and temperature and, and physical conditions and metallicity of the gas, right? So many, many assumptions that are going into this. Nonetheless, this is kind of the, the, the results you generically get, which is that you see that as a function of, in this case, stellar mass, the mass loading factor seems to be basically going up to lower masses. Now, remember I told you at the, at the, on Monday that this is the, at least the kind of trend we need in order to 
explain observations, right? We need that, that the lower mass galaxies have a higher mass loading factor, right? And this just shows the, the velocity. Uh, typically, what's assumed in these simulations is that the, the outflow velocity scales roughly with the circular velocity. Their best fit measurement is actually a little bit shallower than that. That's this dashed line. I'm not sure why the, the black line isn't that good a fit, but anyway. Um, so it's, again, very uncertain. But the mass loading factor is, is sort of the critical thing. Um, however, there's kind of a, a little bit of a catch to this. So if you actually then put this sort of data, this is very similar data from a slightly updated paper, compared to some of the um, uh, mass loading factor scalings that come out of simulations or are assumed in, in this case, Rachel's semi-analytic models, right? What you find is that the measured values are quite a bit lower, okay? Now, maybe that's not surprising. You know, you're only measuring one phase of the gas. There could be a lot of other phases of the gas that are going to add up to a lot more that you haven't observed in this particular set of, of uh, sample. Uh, so it's not a disaster. I think it's, uh, it's quite encouraging that the trends that seem to be required to match you know, observed galaxies uh, seems to be in accord with the trend that you get from, you know, admittedly, these, these, these uncertain observations. So I think that's, uh, that we're coming to a picture now where this is really a part of, you know, conventional galaxy formation. Uh, this is the kind of scaling that they predict. That's that solid line there. And that's, you know, a little bit steeper than fire, but not, not horribly so. It's certainly in that ballpark. Um, in fact, they tend to find a mass outflow rate that, that is actually a bivariate thing. Uh, and so this is something that, you know, may be worth putting into simulations and trying out, which I don't know that people have in cosmological simulations that's dependent on both the star formation rate and the stellar mass. So it goes, so if you, if you convert this to a mass loading factor by dividing by star formation rate, then it goes by star formation rate to the minus one fourth mass, stellar mass to the minus one third. So you can see that, you know, higher, uh, the, the galaxies are gonna have higher uh, mass loading factors, um, you know, when they, when they essentially have lower stellar mass, but also lower, lower star formation rate. Yeah, uh, the 2016 one, I believe. Uh, yeah, or the four. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll have to check. <coughs> okay, so this is this is kind of the state of the art, basically, in generating outflows. So either you try to overpressurize your ISM and then leave it overpressurized by turning off cooling, or you directly just kick particles out. And the two actually give quite different results. Uh, but as you'll see, you know, in the end, we we calibrate to all the sort of similar things. So you know, the things that, that we're interested in give, give sort of uh, pretty similar results, but not always. Okay, so that's, yeah. Can you move a lot of mass around, do you think that's Yeah, a huge amount, right? So the mass loading factor in, you know, let's say in a typical semi cosmological simulation of, you know, 10 to the nine is gonna be what, a factor, the mass loading factor is a factor of 10, so it's 10 times as much star formation, uh, 10 times as much mass outflow as star formation, right? And going out at hundreds of kilometers per second. Yes, yes, yes. So the typical, the typical outflow velocities are off order, are, are larger than the circular velocity, right? So, so not much fallback, do you see? That is a good question. We, we see that. Um, so that, uh, so I discussed that a little bit more on Monday, this, this idea of wind recycling, right? So I'm not going to talk too much about that here because that's something that is not a subgrid prescription. We, we hope at least that our code is doing that properly. Uh, but in fact, it's most likely not, actually. Um, anyway, uh, so, <coughs> okay, so that was, that was essentially galactic outflows, okay? Um, and then we come to, you know, the, the really exciting stuff that, that Priya has been talking about uh, for many lectures now, the black holes, right? So we want to be able to include black holes in our simulations, their growth. Uh, and particularly, as we know, the, the feedback from these black holes is very important for galaxy formation. So we'd like to you know, include uh, all these, these processes. So how do we do this? So again, we're talking about you know, very large scale cosmological simulations. And uh, <coughs> the first thing we have to do is we have to stick black holes somewhere in our, in our simulation, okay, um, magically. Uh, so there, there are several ways to do this. I think the most common way is basically to uh, essentially just uh, form a black hole rather magically when the, the galaxy gets above some mass. All right, so let's say above 10 to the nine solar masses or something like that where you're now resolving the galaxy fairly well. You feel like you just stick a little black hole in there 
uh, you convert one of your gas particles or one of your star particles magically into a black hole, the one that's typically closest to the center of the potential well, and then you go from there, right? Um, there are more sophisticated ideas, obviously. There, there are physically better ways to do this. Uh, I think um, um, Priya talked about the Jillian Belovery's model. And <coughs> so that, uh, so you start, you, uh, in that case, they actually tried to start from, you know, 100 solar mass things and then merge it up self-consistently to create supermassive black holes. And it's mildly successful. Uh, I think the problem with this is that you really sort of need super high resolution because you have to sort of, you know, at least come close to resolving that mass, and that's, that can be challenging. So we can't really do that in cosmological case. So essentially all cosmological, large-scale cosmological simulations use something akin to that, the first one. Um, okay, so then you have to decide what happens when the black holes come close to each other. Again, very simple stuff, right? Essentially when they get there within their own softening lengths, we just kind of just magically merged them, you know, fairy wand and, and they're merged. Uh, there are now trying to, you know, includes, I think Paul Torrey is working on stuff like this where, where you're trying to include a model to follow the in spiral and, and, and you know, make predictions for things like LISA. So that's, that's certainly very exciting and, and would be great. I'm not sure if it's going to be dynamically impactful for the galaxy. Um, then there's the, position, the issue of positioning. And this is a, another one of these sort of, you know, uh, things that gets swept under the rug a lot, but it turns out to be a really annoying thing, okay? And here's the basic problem. The basic problem is, again, goes back to resolution. If you have a poor resolution and you have a potential well in the center of your galaxy and it's a softened potential, what's that potential going to look like? It's going to look like that, right? Um, the real potential looks like this, right? And the black hole is sitting way down here. That's what the real potential looks like. In your code, if you just put the back hole at the center, the, the minimum of the potential, that's great. But it's got a very shallow potential. It can wander all over the place, right? And wander out of the galaxy. This happens a lot, okay, if you, if you don't do anything about this, okay? Uh, so you, you, can, you can do nothing, and then you end up with all kinds of galaxies and with, without black holes, and then, or maybe you reseed them, and you get like all kinds of, you know. So it, it really doesn't work at all. So you have to do something. Uh, to keep the, the black hole in the center of the galaxy. Uh, and this is, you know, this is why it's very difficult to do these sort of accretion calculations from even from very high resolution uh, simulations. Essentially, any time you have a softened potential, you know, the, the, you're going to face this, this problem. And uh, you're going to you're gonna fool yourself if you think that you know, somehow you can keep the black hole in the center without doing anything. Um, <clears throat> so again, you know, the simplest, you know, dumb solution, which again, a lot of people, including us, basically use, is that you say that, okay, we're going to identify the galaxy, and as the simulation goes on, we're going to identify the, where the minimum potential of that galaxy is, and if the black hole happens to wander off a little bit from it, we're just going to stick it back on there, okay? So literally, we have teleporting black holes in our simulations, okay? Uh, so we have these teleporting black holes, 10 to the 6 solar mass or whatever they are, uh, teleporting back to the center of the potential well, um, so that, you know, uh, that's obviously we would <laughs> not like to do that, but uh, no one has really come up with, the people have tried a bunch of other th different ideas, like include a strong drag term, but this is really weird because now you're actually, you know, uh, changing the laws of physics <laughs> effectively, uh, you know, and you're going to impact the surrounding matter in a way that maybe is not consistent with, you know, regular Newtonian dynamics or something. Uh, or you, you say that, okay, I'm going to assign the black hole a very high dynamical mass, so I'm going to try to artificially create a deep potential well at the black hole position by just saying that the black, dynamically, I'm going to say even though the black hole is 10 to the 6 solar mass, I'm going to say it's 10 to the 8 solar mass when I compute gravity, right? But again, that does things to the surrounding particles that are not so good, right? So this is why most people continue to use this, even though it's, it really sounds pretty silly, right? Uh, okay. So there's your black hole. It's sitting in the center of your potential well. Uh, now you've seeded it. You've, you've got it going. Uh, what happens to it? Well, it's got to accrete. Okay, so now the black hole's got to accrete. Uh, so how is it going to accrete? Well, <coughs> again, uh, this, this goes back to work um, that, that was pioneered by Volker Springle and Lars and Tiziana Di Matteo and, and a bunch of uh, others. Um, and their idea was very simple that, okay, well, um, you know, we have this, this analytic model, the Bondi-Littleton-Hoyle -Little accretion model, 
and we can compute the parameters of this model in our simulations and therefore get the black hole accretion rate. Okay, so, uh, so here's the Bondi formula, well, without that alpha, uh, you know, which again, you've seen this before, it depends on the black hole mass squared, the local density around the black hole, and then the sound speed, again, the velocity is typically taken to be zero or very small because, uh, <coughs> because uh, essentially you're, you're fixing the black hole position at the center of the galaxy. Okay, that sounds all well and good, and certainly you can, you can, you can compute numbers for rho and, and your sound speed, but again, physically you have to think about what is actually these, these numbers, right? Uh, if you are imagining that your black hole is growing in, your black hole's growth mode is typically in this radiatively efficient um, regime where you have this thin disk, that thin disk is gonna be pretty cold, right? That sound speed, is not going to be the sound speed of the, that you have in the gas because of your two-phase medium, all right? So you have to do something about this, right? Some people ignore that altogether, and they just use whatever sound speed they get from their two-phase thing. Others have tried to put this alpha factor, so that was initially uh, what, what these folks did, is they added an alpha factor, right, which, if you, which is basically trying to say, okay, well, we can't resolve the sound speed, and really the same thing applies to the density as well. The density is supposed to be this high thing in the middle, but uh, you don't resolve that because you have some sort of a softened density, right? So, so that's not the real density that you should be using in the Bondi formula. So you just put in this factor alpha, and then people started you know, engaging in, in big astro PH or archive wars about what alpha should be and trying to scale it with radius and all these kinds of things. But essentially, it's, it's arising from the fact that you actually just can't measure the things that you want to measure uh, accurately in your cosmological simulation. There's other issues, however, um, <coughs> besides that. And uh, another of the issues is that <coughs> Um, you, you have this very steep dependence on, on black hole mass with your, with your black hole accretion rate. So what's wrong with that? Well, essentially what this means then is that at low mass black holes, you're going to accrete very slowly, but at, once you get to high mass black holes, you're going to accrete super, super fast. Okay? And the problem with this is if you start off on the M sigma relation and you're accreting at this rate, right? Um, you're not going to stay on the M sigma relation. You're going to wander off. You're going to basically grow too fast, right? You're not going to satisfy that relation. So in order to have models that actually produce something like M sigma, uh, essentially this model requires that the black hole growth be self-regulating. In other words, that the, the high, when you have these high accretion rates, you should also have some sort of a high energy output rate that balances that accretion and you know, somehow lands you right on the, the black hole M sigma relation. Now, Priya went through the mathematics. You, know, you can write, do this sort of analytically in the spherical approximation, and it magically, it, it kind of works. It gives you something like M goes a sigma to the fourth or M goes a sigma to the fifth, depending on exactly what assumptions you make. Uh, but you get something in the right regime by just saying that the energy is dumped spherically around the black hole, and that somehow retards the, the accretion. OK, great. The problem with this is that when you start to put this into full self-consistent 3D models, right, you no longer have these assumptions of sphericity very nicely, right? And, uh, and essentially what, this, what has happened is that the models that use this Bondi accretion are driven to a very spherical form of feedback from the black hole in order to have that self-regulation work. If you don't do that, you don't get the self-regulation you need, right? You grow the black hole too fast. So they all use spherical feedback, which would be fine, except for the fact that when we actually go and observe any sort of black hole feedback, it's never very spherical, right? It's usually in these jets or, or these you know, winds that are fairly collimated, whatever, right? So that's a, a little bit of a disconnect with this model that's a, a little bit frustrating, right? Because ideally, we would like to be able to, to have the sort of jets that you see you know, coming out of these galaxies, you know, we, we can measure their properties and their mass, out, uh, their momentum outflow rates and their, their energetics and so on and so forth. And we'd like those jets to be doing the quenching, uh, but, you know, those aren't spherical and that will not work. And, you know, that was initially tried by, by Tiziana. It, it basically didn't work. Okay. So, um, 
the other, of course, more technical issue, and I, I think Priya talked about this as well, is this, this issue that, that it's actually, you know, the Bondi accretion model assumes that you have a static halo of gas around it that is, has zero angular momentum. So the limiting factor is just gravitational capture from a hot medium, right? And there's no angular momentum involved. Um, <coughs> so I think Priya mentioned this, uh, this formula or, or this, this model before, this is the Hopkins and Quadert model, so Phil and Elliot took a s stab at this problem, I mean, uh, based on uh, you know, what, what people had done uh, for, for accretion disk theory, and said, okay, suppose you had a disk, and uh, it was uh, uh, perturbed, right? You had some disk instabilities caused by some external perturbations. Um, what, sort of inst what sort of torque would, would those disks be, would the gas be subject to, and what kind of accretion rates would one get out of this? So they developed an analytic model, and then they ran a whole bunch of like really super high resolution, you know, very small simulations to kind of confirm this. And uh, based on a whole bunch of other assumptions, they came up with a nice little analytic formula, right, that, that we could, again, uh, connect the, the large scale things we can measure things like the mass of the black hole, the mass of the disk. Now, this is not the accretion disk of the black hole, but rather the inner disk of the galaxy on sort of kiloparsec scales, right? Uh, the radius, uh, the gas fraction, so on and so forth. And what they showed in their paper <coughs> is that um, if you take the, uh, the, the, the accretion rate that they measure in these extremely high resolution simulations and plot it against what you get from that formula, right? Even if you use a smoothing of around 30 parsecs, you get a pretty good correlation. What was really encouraging for us is that even when you use one kiloparsec, right? Now that's the kind of resolution we have. You still get a pretty good correlation between the simulated accretion rate, you know, in, in their idealized simulation versus what that formula predicts, right? And <coughs> conversely, if you compare it to what you would say the Bondi formula would give you, it's a scatter plot, okay? So it, so the Bondi formula doesn't really describe that situation at all, okay? So we thought, okay, so this was the, the thesis project of Daniel Angles Alcazar, who is, uh, you know, some of you will, well, hopefully mo all of you will meet when he finally arrives in a couple of weeks. Um, <coughs> um, and the interesting, you know, some interesting features about this model are the following. The black holes do not need to self-regulate in this model. Okay, that's probably the number one uh, key thing that drives most of the interesting feature features in this, in this model. Essentially, the black holes, if you think about this formula, right, rather than the, 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 the accretion scaling as black hole mass squared, it's scaling with some very weak power of black holes. Right? And this is a pretty generic outcome of this type of scenario. Why? Because again, we're dri being driven by disk torques, not, not anything really to do with the black hole. Right? So it has a very weak dependence on black hole mass, which means that essentially it's driven by things like you know, the, the disk mass and the, the disk fraction. Well, these are also the same sort of things that correlate with star formation in the overall galaxy. Right? The disk mass, you know, the more mass of your disk is, the more star formation you're going to have. So the black holes in the galaxies kind of grow alongside each other. Right? They grow concordantly. As a result, you end up with sort of a, a roughly linear relation between the black hole, um, uh, the black hole mass and you know, something along here, bulge mass, or you can use total stellar mass, whatever you like. Right? So this relation, this M sigma relation, this, the, the black lines are the Herring and Rick's uh, observations. Uh, and then this shows what happens if we start at a whole bunch of different seed values for our black holes. It's pretty insensitive to this. It kind of just, uh, the, the M sigma relation kind of becomes an attractor solution in this model. So rather than trying to have to tune self-regulation, we sort of get this for free, right? There is one free parameter in this model, and the free parameter is essentially this, what's in the formula is called alpha sub t. We started calling it for some reason epsilon. Uh, <coughs> and it's the fraction of mass that you send into your you know, inner near the black hole that you resolve, that, the fraction of that mass that actually makes it onto the black hole, right? And accretion disk people tell us you know, that it's up order a few percent, five percent, ten percent, something like that. So that basically sets the amplitude of your M sigma relation in, the, in your final prediction. And you see that for values of, of order you know, between one and ten percent, you know, maybe 5%, we're sort of in the right ballpark, right? 
So, so that's, that's, that's a, a, an advantage of this model. So uh, as you might guess, this is a little bit of a, a hobby horse of ours uh, that, that we like this torque limited accretion model for a variety of reasons. And basically, you know, while, while it's nice to use that full formula, essentially all the features of the torque limited model come from the fact that uh, the, the, the accretion rate scales very slowly with black hole mass, and it scales really more with the kind of ma parameters that also uh, drive star formation in the, in the disk. And so you get this sort of co-growth very naturally being an outcome rather than something you have to sort of uh, balance, right? Um, the big advantage of this, I'll, well, I'll come back to that later. Okay. Um, okay. So then, great. So we're growing our black hole, and we're accreting a bunch of mass onto the black hole. Uh, now we've got to think about the feedback, right? So we've got to think about what, what the black holes are, are going to actually do, right? Um, <clears throat> and um, this sort of um, is really um, a, not really a detour, but, but kind of the, 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 the observational framework in which many of the moder modern models are, are being sort of cast, which is this, uh, this um, dichotomy uh, between uh, and we heard about this as well from, from, uh, from Priya, about how at, at high Eddington ratios, you're in sort of this radiative mode, and the way you, you know, the, the cartoon that's drawn here in this very nice uh, Heckman and Best annual review article, if you're interested in this stuff, you should definitely read that. Uh, it's, it's really observationally focused, but it has some basic modeling details. And you have this sort of accretion disk, which is radiatively efficient because it's thin and cool and can survive. And because of this, uh, at, the, at these high Eddington rates, you get a, certain, you get a class of, of objects which you can define you know, observationally. Uh, so this is radio loud stuff. Remember, most things are radio quiet, not radio loud. So <coughs> you can have these, these sort of uh, type, type two and type one um, Seifert type galaxies, and then once you go to very low Eddington ratios, you end up with a situation where the, the, the thin disk cannot form. You get this ADAF mode, so they call it jet mode. I kind of think ADAF mode is a, is a, uh, might be a better, descript more descriptive, but essentially you have this ADAF region, which is going to more slowly feed the black hole. But it turns out, from, again, from accretion disk modeling, this tends to give rise to jets. Right? So this is where you get the very fast radio jets or, or whatnot, right? So there's this dichotomy that depends on this, this, uh, this accretion rate, right? So again, in cosmological simulations, we can calculate what this is. This, I'm calling it lambda up there, right? We can calculate what that is because we have a black hole mass, which tells us our Eddington rate, and we have the black hole accretion rate, which comes from our, one of our models, right? So, <coughs> so then we can sort of split the, the feedback into two types of modes that we actually, you know, which correspond to these two types of AGN. So that's kind of the, the, the background I wanted to just set the stage in for discussing, discussing black hole feedback. So, <coughs> um, so, you know, again, going back a little bit historically, the first thing that, you know, you do when you have sort of black hole uh, growth uh, that was done in the, the earliest sort of uh, models by, by Lars and Folker and others, um, that, that, that you basically just add the heat spherically to the surrounding gas, so you take some fraction of the AGN uh, accretion luminosity, the m, m dot c squared, and you take some, some fraction of it, let's say a few percent, you add it to the surrounding gas, and because you know, c squared is a large number, even this small amount of uh, feedback can, can result in unbinding a lot of gas in the galaxy, so on and so forth. Um, nonetheless, this doesn't really do a great job of producing quenched galaxies, as uh, I think I'll say in just another show in just another minute. So you can do the Eagle approach. Again, we have this sort of thing where you store up the energy for a while. In this case, you have to store it to actually, um, you know, similar or even higher temperatures. Uh, and then because of this, of course, the AGN energy is so much that instead of just driving sort of nice, gentle, few hundred kilometers second, uh, you know, star formation winds, you know, when you take, you know, 0.5 mc squared, you really get, you know, uh, some very, very rapid outflows, okay? So, <clears throat> so that's, and you'll see that's able to, to quench galaxies. Another way to do it is to try to use kinetic, um, kinetic uh, outflows. So again, more analogous to the way that kinetic outflows are done in, in uh, star formation 
feedback. Again, we have to choose something like a velocity and a mass loading factor, but these things are things that are, can be estimated from observations. So typically, you know, velocities in the radiative mode are around 1,000 kilometers per second, and, uh, and basically, um, uh, you know, it can, can scale maybe with, with properties of the, of the black hole. So, <coughs> um, so that's, that's, that's another way to sort of, you know, get the energy out. Um, the key thing is, of course, the kinetic mode, during the growth phase of the black hole, uh, Bondi accretion has a hard time working with the kinetic mode, again, because Bondi accretion requires that you have spherical feedback to self-regulate, right? So if you don't have that, uh, it ends up being uh, not so effective at doing things like quenching galaxies. So we include this, but you know, part of the reason that works is because we have this, this uh, torque-limited accretion model. The other thing that people typically imply is an ed ed Eddington cap. Um, again, I, I think it's, uh, you know, Eddington limit should be sort of regarded like, you know, like uh, traffic signals in India, you know, sort of a rough guide, not really a strict law. Uh, so, <coughs> um, you know, it, it, so it, it depends on what you want to do with that. But uh, at least what happens in a lot of the, the models that use Bondi accretion to, to try to grow very early back black holes, like, like Yuxing Li's early models with this, uh, essentially the, 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 the rate is pinned to the Eddington rate for, for most of the, the uh, so you're not really doing anything with Bondi accretion, you're just essentially straight up just accreting at the Eddington rate. Okay, so that's, that's basically, you know, a quick survey of how black hole feedback is done. So let's, uh, just a couple of figures there, but that, anyway, uh, just to show, just to now talk about some of the recent cosmological simulation projects that have been going on um, in the last sort of 10, 15 minutes, well, maybe it might be a little bit more, uh, that, 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 have, that have showed up in the recent literature, so uh, it, just to give you kind of a feel for some of the parameters that are involved. So again, you can choose your code, right, so choose your, you know, uh, start your start your engines. You can choose your code. Uh, so you know this has been done with Ramses or the Repo with you know sort of modern SPH with old SPH that had problems that have been discussed by Romana and others. You can use the new MFM type stuff, so on and so forth. The typical values you're looking at are, are box sizes of around you know 50 to 100 h inverse megaparsecs, right? And the typical numbers of particles are of order a thousand ish or cells, if you wish, uh, and now people are starting to do uh, much bigger ones. So this 205 megaparsec illustrious TNG one actually has 2,500 cube particles, quite impressive. And look at that puppy right there. Okay, uh, so that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, the blue tide simulation, it's just an amazing technological feat, even if the, the model is still old SPH or whatever. Um, of course, the problem is they, they've essentially stalled out just below a range of seven now. <laughs> so, I mean, they can't, but the, but the whole point was to study reionization with that. So, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, so that's, so it is technically possible to run these uh, incredibly large things. It's just right now we're, we're CPU limited typically by these things. I mean, it's not, a, you know, if we had infinite computing power, we could run a 7,000 cubed or a 10,000 cubed and, and just do it, right? Uh, but, but we are limited by, by computing power at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and of course the, the end-body simulations, I mean, well, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but they've already exceeded the tri trillion particle mark. Uh, in association with that are often uh, Zoom projects. So uh, I think you all know what Zoom galaxy Zoom simulations are. You basically pick out a few uh, a galaxies in your, in your simulation that you're interested in, and then take those particles that you're interested in out to maybe a couple virial radii or three virial radii around those galaxies, look back in the initial conditions, encompass those in a big sphere, take everything else around it and turn it into just n body without any gas, right? And only do gas inside that sphere, right? And the hope is that that then condenses down into the galaxy, but now you can put a lot more particles in that sphere because you're not doing the whole rest of the simulation anymore. And because of that, you can afford to get much higher resolution in that spherical region, right? But the downside is you only get like a handful of galaxies. You get one the central galaxy you wanted and then maybe a few satellites or things that happen to be around it. So that's all you get, right? Um, but nonetheless, they're very interesting because now you can essentially take the exact same physics that you had for your large scale code and turn that into 
um, you know, a higher resolution version of it to see how it behaves, right? Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. So again, lots of different projects. Auriga, uh, Auriga using uh, Lustrous. Uh, Nihao is using this gasoline code. There's been, you can, do you can do zooms at any scale. So, you know, in this, in this case, what they did is rather than trying to go to higher resolution, what they did is they actually took a much larger volume and picked out a bunch of clusters and ran the same physics as they did in, in the this 100 megaparsec eagle box, except now they're doing it, you know, on these giant clusters which didn't appear in the 100 megaparsec eagle box. So that's another way you can use the zoom technique, right? So like Hydrangea and Sea Eagle do this. Uh, New Horizon is something that's that's coming up as well with the Horizon AGN code, where they rather than tracking individual galaxies, they just took a, a region, um, a 20 megaparsec uh, radius region uh, within Horizon AGN, or just redoing that one at, at much higher resolution. Uh, then of course there's Fire, which doesn't actually connect to any particular cosmological code, but uh, you know includes a lot of new uh, physical processes and so on and so forth. So. So that's, that's the idea of zooms, and just to give you a flavor for you know, what kind of galaxies come out of these zooms, so this is from this, again, fairly nice, if you're interested in galaxy microphysics, this Knob and Ostriker annual review article is quite interesting. Um, <coughs> um, and it's just a montage of various ones. You know, this is from the, the gasoline project simulation, as is that, I think. This is from the Arepo uh, simulation, this is from one of uh, Torsten's uh, modern SPH simulations. So all these, and this is, this is fire here. So um, again, you can really see that, that you, know, you, you would have no hope of, of creating something like this in a cosmological simulation, uh, you know, maybe with you know, very high resolution, you know, illustrious TNG 50 box, you might be able to do stuff like this, but otherwise you're really achieving quite remarkable resolution. Um, within these zoom simulations. So it allows you to study internal properties, internal structural properties of galaxies much better. Okay, so what about, okay, so we have all these simulations. We have, you know, all picked our favorite uh, subgrid recipe. We're gonna throw it all in the box. What's gonna come out? So this is where, of course, you know, the, the whatever the, you get the rubber beating the road that we have to actually figure out how do we actually reproduce these, these particular uh, barometers that we typically use for saying how well is our, is our go codes reproducing galaxy formation. So, um, so the, the, the most sort of commonly used tuning thing, right, or, or thing that people try to look at first to make sure that their codes agree with is this galaxy stellar mass function, which is equivalently stated as a stellar mass halo mass relation, okay? Since the halo mass function is, you know, well determined by lambda CDM. So, um, so again, basically you're asking the question when you compare to the, halo, the stellar mass function is, do you reproduce the fraction of baryons in stars as a function of halo mass? That's the question you're trying to ask. So it's a combination, again, of, of your star formation law, your prescription for feedback, as well as you know, in both regimes, so it's it's kind of an all-inclusive test where you have to have the stellar, uh, the star formation feedback at low mass halo masses, and then once you get above ten to the twelve, you have to do the EGN feedback to get that right. So you have to get all those things right, right, to get this right. So that's why people like it. It's sort of a very uh, encompassing test. Nonetheless, it's you know, there's it, it's sort of like that's an advantage as well as a disadvantage because it can you know you can get that in a lot of different ways. So you'd like to be able to test. Uh, other sort of things, mass metallicity relation uh, is a particularly good test of the outflow prescription. Uh, the galaxy star formation rate stellar mass relation, if you see the evolution of it, uh, is, is measuring your growth rate of galaxies, uh, your galaxy sizes, right? Maybe you can't do all internal structure in these high resolution, uh, in these cosmological simulations, but you can certainly do things like galaxy sizes, and that tests, you know, things like angular momentum redistribution due to outflows, because this is one, you know, it's been one of the classic problems of galaxy from early galaxy formation simulations is that they produced too small sizes because there was too much dissipation, uh, and that's because they didn't have outflows that were kicking out the low angular momentum gas, right? So essentially, this is a test of whether that's working in your model, and then this sort of frontier of CGM. So let's quickly go through some of these comparisons to see uh, see how modern simulations are doing, right? Uh, sort of a scorecard, if you will, and the answer is, of course, that. Um, you know, no one is getting everything right, but a lot of people are getting a lot of different things right, okay? So if we look at, for instance, the stellar mass function at redshift zero, 
Uh, what's shown here is a bunch of dashed lines, which are simulations. I've just highlighted a few of them that are, that are shown up there. And then a bunch of solid lines, which are semi-analytic models. We haven't talked about much about that, but you can see that essentially, you know, we get a pretty good fit to all of them, right, at, at redshift zero. That's not terribly surprising because typically that's what we've really worked hard to get, okay? And, and that's good, right? Because like 10 years ago, we couldn't get that, right? So that's, that's nice that we're now having success with that. But as you see, as you go out to higher redshift, already we start to see maybe some discrepancies here that, that virtually all the models, and certainly all the, the simulation models, the SAMs do better, the simulation models tend to overpredict the, the stellar mass function at redshift two. Um, <coughs> and, uh, you know, and then redshift four, things get pretty ratty. Um, Okay, so that looked, still, it's not terrible, right? Okay, mass metallicity relation. Okay, well, this is more of a, uh, uh, you know, mess here, right? So, so this is the observations are, well, depending on which calibration you like, the gray, gray points are the observations. And yeah, they're crazy, right? I mean, some of them are pretty steep. So things like illustrious and, um, and our simulations, which both use these kinetics outflows, right? In order to suppress the faint end of the mass function enough, we had to have really strong outflows at low masses. But when we had really strong outflows, we also get rid of too many metals, right? And this has always been a real tension, right? Eagle, on the other hand, does not use kinetic outflows. They use this sort of overpressurization and turning off cooling, or at least uh, t to a high temperature. So they get, you know, a much flatter mass metallicity relation, right? Uh, so maybe that's that's closer to the right answer. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say, right? Uh, but that's, that's, that's quite a different uh, physical model. And then the evolution again, you know, you see sort of similar trends. But the point is like, you know, suddenly, you know, think everything looked good in one thing, but now you start to look at something else and things don't look quite so good anymore. Here is a very interesting one, the star formation rate stellar mass, right? Okay, again, at rich of zero, most of the models are doing pretty well. I know what that Sam's doing, but the rest of them are doing pretty well, okay? Um, but immediately, as you just go out to range of one or range of two, and every single model is low, right? Now that's weird, right? You would expect that there would be some kind of scatter and stuff like there's all different star formation prescriptions and all this kind of thing. It's actually not that hard to understand why this is so uniform like this, right? Because when you think about it, this quantity is an integral of this quantity, right? That's all it is, modulo some you know, stellar evolution effects. Right, which are well known. The problem is, if we say that, okay, I'm gonna change my feedback, and I'm gonna multiply this by a half, or two, or five, or whatever it is, right? Well, once you integrate that, that factor is gonna cancel out, and you're just gonna move along a linear relation. Well, this thing is just about pretty much a linear relation. So changing your feedback model moves you in this direction. It doesn't move you in this direction, right? What is this direction set by? This direction is si simply set by how your, your gas inflow rate. How much mass are you providing? Remember this sort of galaxy factory model, right? It's how much, mo how much stuff you're providing, and that's set by lambda CDM. That's just your accretion rate, right? So all of these things are assuming lambda CDM. Modulo minor differences, they all get the same value. That's really good, except for the fact that the data is off by a factor of two or three, right? What that is, I'm not totally sure. I don't know if that has, I mean, there are models that are somewhat contrived that actually fix this, but, um, but it's a real issue. Um, and it, you, know, you know, you hate to be that, that theorist, right? Don't be that theorist that just every time the, the models don't agree, you blame the data, right? Uh, say the data somehow got it wrong, but really. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So I think, you know, quite possibly it's, it's actually the observers who got it wrong, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's the point. Is that is that uh, you know there may be systematic calibration issues at redshift two, but if it's affecting our star formation rates by a factor of two or three, we should know what they are. I mean, this is pretty important, right? Uh, so if if that's really the answer, fine. But you know, if this problem has been around for a long time now. Basically, 2007, Emanuele Dati pointed out, and also in a 2000 paper, 2008 paper, I sort of pointed out as well, um, and. <coughs> uh, yeah, no one has yet been able to identify exactly what observational uh, problem there is in analysis that, that might explain this. There are a lot of ideas, there are a lot of things that are like twiddle factor of three or two, but you know, why, why are we getting it systematically wrong? It's unclear. Okay, what about galaxy sizes? Uh, again, 
the situation is sort of, you know, pretty good, not, you know, surprisingly good, like uh, in the sense that, you know, again, if we made this plot 10 years ago, the, the models would be way, way off from the data. Now we're not too bad, uh, but we're still not getting it totally right. Uh, so they, the, the Eagle folks particularly made a big deal about saying that, you know, they tried a whole bunch of different star formation, ways of doing star formation, and they said that it made almost no difference to the stellar mass function. They always get the stellar mass function right. However, it made a huge difference to the galaxy sizes, right? Um, so that's kind of nice because, you know, your star formation prescription, right, is converting gas into stars, but the star formation rate is really, you know, integrated, is really set by your cosmic accretion rate more than anything else, right? So no matter whether what you do with this, what it, once it gets in there, once you sort of convert it into stars on some level, you know, the stellar mass function is going to look similar. But the galaxy sizes are going to be very dependent on exactly where you put that gas and how you convert it into stars. And so these are, these are some of their unsuccessful uh, eagle models. Um, and then here's their, you know, their favorite reference model that they did. Okay. So what did they do to get this right? Well, what they did okay, is that <coughs> they said, okay, what we really need is that our massive galaxies, which are starting to get all this dense gas, are not using up that gas fast enough and basically not creating enough outflows in the central region that are, that are pushing the gas out. So what they did is they increased the star formation efficiency. They had a steeper scaling of star formation efficiency once the gas density exceeded some high value. That high value wasn't even that high. It was 10 atoms per cubic centimeter. Okay? So above 10 atoms per cubic centimeter, they're no longer using the Kennecott schmidt prescription. They're using a steeper prescription for that exponent. What that does creates more stars, creates more feedback, blows more stuff out, and creates uh, galaxies that agree better with the sizes. Okay? Um, so so that's, that's you know, an example of how you know, you know, everything might look good to you. you, know, you wouldn't, I, I would say from this, you, you don't care about what you're doing with your star formation prescription, but here you clearly do. Right? So these are complementary constraints. Um, don't want to go into details too much, but SDSS versus illustrious, SDSS versus Mufasa, uh, each one has some small issues. You know, the illustrious ones tend to be a little too bright above a fixed stellar mass limit compared to SDSS. Again, the key thing with these things is that you really have to do things you know, in the observational plane. You have to take your simulations and turn them into photometry, measure the isophotal radius, otherwise you don't get these, the, 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 the proper answer before you compare to data. So for instance, Mufasa seems to get, ignore these big ellipses here, sorry, this is kind of a draft thing, but uh, the data from SDSS are these dotted lines for the blue galaxies, so we split them into blue and red. We get the blue galaxies about right, but we get the red galaxies quite wrong, okay? Uh, especially at low masses. So we're getting, uh, we're, we're, we're somehow not doing that. And it doesn't turn out to be a resolutional issue. We've looked at uh, resolution convergence in higher resolution cases. Okay, so that's, that's that. Um, okay, very briefly about the CGM. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but this is sort of, I just want to introduce the idea that because we have all this way of now constraining uh, the models in, in sort of, a, but with all the galaxy properties, the, the properties that you predict for the CGM are very sensitive to how you blow stuff out and what that stuff does once it mixes into the surrounding gas, right? And so you can make predictions for, particularly for a lot of these quasar absorption line surveys for H1 and magnesium-2, things like that. Oxygen-6 is a very popular one. Um, and again, there, there seems to be a very generic problem that virtually every model underproduces. So this is Mufasa's model here. This is uh, the actual data from COS halos. This is COS halos data. This is uh, Eagle. Uh, it's a little harder to see here, but the well, points should most, you see most of the points lie above the, the, the same colored line. So we're always underproducing the amount of O6 in the CGM. It's a strange thing. Um, let me skip the magnesium two uh, stuff. So, <clears throat> so just, you know, to sort of wrap up, like what, what are, you know, some of the, the you know, many, uh, uh, some of many of the many outstanding puzzles, right, uh, which hopefully have sort of illustrated some of these uh, there's this issue that the mass function turns down very quickly, predominantly at redshift zero, which is a strange thing, not so much seen at higher redshifts. And we can only get this with very extreme onset of quenching. Uh, 
the, the uh, I didn't talk about this too much, but what's going on with the mass metallicity relation? Why are things so different? Uh, the star formation rate stellar mass problem. Um, and then, you know, essentially the, the CGM, I think, is, is a really interesting test bed for trying to understand what these models are, what these outflow models are doing on sort of larger scales. So I think that that's going to be in the future going to be uh, one of the most constraining things as the data get better and better. Right now the data is relatively, uh, you know, low quality compared to what you can get for galaxies. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, I think, you know, uh, the, the take home message is that, you know, we're in a pretty good place with galaxy formation models in the sense that we can now reproduce at least some of the basic constraints. And so <coughs> we, can, we can now start to work on things that are a little bit more advanced or, or complicated. And uh, we need sort of, uh, I, I think, to, to the, the, the problem is kind of flipped around now that, that we have lots of models that can agree with something like the mass function. And they have very different subgrid prescriptions, right? So how are we going to actually tell which one is right? Uh, so we, you know, we can do comparisons to other, other data, but that can be you know, tricky as well. Uh, I think we really need a lot of more guidance from high resolution simulations and things that are doing the physics much more correctly to try to say, you know, what should our subgrade prescriptions actually be, right? Um, and, you know, some of, the, some of the things that we really need to do is, you know, we need to stop treating the ISM as, as smooth blobs, right? Or smooth blobs, you know, with, with some dots, some cold dots inside. That we need to understand what drives these outflows because that's going to set the, the, both the acceleration and the physical conditions, the, the density and temperature of those outflows. So that's very important, going to be very important for the CGM, uh, particularly outflow interactions with ambient gas. You know, in the, in the sort of kinetic model, you're shooting these individual gas elements, right? No gas code ever is designed to, to treat individual gas elements as single particles, right? You're always supposed to be smoothing or doing something, right? To, uh, so that's inherently problematic, right? And so it's, it's worth thinking about, you know, what, how do we actually try to model that interaction a little bit better than just decoupling it for a while and then magically turning on hydro when it gets 20 kiloparsecs away or whatever. Uh, and then, of course, there's lots of, you know, which I haven't even talked about, all these other new physical processes that might be important. So I think it's a very exciting time. I think there's a lot of synergy between observations and data at this point, and uh, I think we can make progress pretty rapidly in the coming years, uh, but it relies on people like you. So, okay, that's it. So one of the things that you were talking about was in the star formation prescriptions, including kind of an explicit, you know, H2 component, and yeah. saying, okay, this is the bit that forms stars. Right. I remember reading in the Fire 2 paper that they said that that wasn't, so all of the particles that ended up forming stars were already fully H2. So do you see a difference in, in kind of the larger scale simulations where you have less, less resolution that, you know, okay, well, now I can actually only use half of this particle to form the stars, or... Yeah, um, so that's, that's a good point, right? Because again, we have this problem that we're not resolving the substructure within the SPH particle or whatever MFM particle or repo cell or whatever it is. Um, and so in reality, most of that matter might have actually condensed down sufficiently to form, form H2 already. So I think, you know, the idea is if, you know, that's, that's kind of um, what, what the subgrid prescriptions will hopefully help us with, right? It's why I've sort of preferred sticking with a subgrid prescription rather than trying to do this full chemi H2 chemical reaction network because I, no, ma no matter what you do with that, you know, if you still have even 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 3 solar mass particles, you're not resolving the things that are actually forming H2, right? So, uh, so there's some inherent limitations to that that, that that's, that's a very, you know, very good to point out, yeah. Isn't there some inconsistency between getting the stellar mass function right, a redshift zero, but get always being under the star formation rate? Like, don't you yes. have to, shouldn't you, shouldn't all the stellar, shouldn't there not be enough high mass galaxies? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a bit weird, right? Because there's been claims that there ha is a disagreement in that, and then there's a claim that it dis isn't a disagreement, and it's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, 
is essentially you know how 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 good your prescription of your glasses is because if you hold it far enough away, it's only a factor of two it, at redshift two, and so you know even down to redshift one or so if you integrate that. But it is a little weird. There uh, there does seem to be some inconsistency with that, and you know that's kind of one of the things I try to point out. In my 2008 paper is sort of arguing against a solution that is you know theoretical that it, that it really is some sort of an observational issue. Uh, that that basically you're measuring that wrong because otherwise yeah the integral should equal the uh, obviously the instantaneous of, uh, yeah. So um, the the you mentioned you showed a plot where where there's difficulty in trying to reproduce the software mimicking sequence from models compared to observations. So is this something that um, from for example, um, intensity mapping of CO, C plus, um, and also constraining the luminosity functions using those lines are going to help because you mentioned it could be uh, because of the accretion rate of the gas into galaxies. Yeah, I mean, well, one of the one of the key things I think you know is going to be to get new star formation rate indicators that maybe are a little bit better, uh, well, not better calibrated, but maybe at least differently calibrated than the ones we've traditionally used. So typically, most of those plots came from using some sort of a UV star formation rate, you know, con UV continuum star formation rate. You, you dust correct that. There, yeah, or, or, right, so, or, or use 24 micron, which has its own particular problems at redshift two because you're redshifting directly into the PA band. Do we really understand PA that well enough, right? So uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, so, so, uh, I think you know that's where things like the far infrared measures, if we can get those, you know, dust continuum measures uh, to, to measure the, the properly the gas content, uh, the obviously far infrared luminosity, if we can calibrate that, the C2, whatever, uh, and then radio. I think radio is in principle really good if we can, you know, if it's extinction free, all this sort of lovely thing, uh, if we can really calibrate it in a believable way. So, uh, yeah. So I think that you're right. There's a lot of room for progress in the far infrared and radio on that problem. Okay, I think, um, I think we'll, we'll break for lunch now, but oh, a favor. Uh, reminder that Chris, uh, Chris Martin is available at lunch, and, and uh, I don't know how many students we can fit at his table, but, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, please take this opportunity to, to meet with him. And let's thank um, both speakers from this morning. Did you have a? I just, I just wanted to say that after lunch, we'll reconvene at 2 o'clock for the last three contributed talks. And then that will be the end of the, um, the talks for today. So we'll see you back in here at 2. <laughs>